council meeting, but this is our first briefing and meeting cycle for the year. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to welcome everyone who's come along to the meeting this evening and also I'd like to welcome Virginia Miltrop who is joining us as our new Director of Community and Business and this is her first meeting and she's just joined us on Monday so we'll uh, go easy on our questions. <laughs> Um, so I'll just, we do have a full house tonight so we don't have any apologies or council members on leave of absence so um, I will go straight to public question time and receiving a public statement so um, welcome members of the public gallery, uh, this is your opportunity if you wish to come forward to the microphone and speak on an item on the agenda this evening or ask a question. Um, please, we just ask that you state your name, the suburb in which you live, and um, we do ask if you could keep to three minutes. There's no set order, it's just whoever would like to come forward first. So, welcome to the first person who'd like And we'll move to declarations of interest. We have nil this evening. So, basically, um, what happens here is that we will go through the items and uh, it's a question and answer before council members to ask questions of our administration to seek further information. Given that we've had two items raised um, in the public gallery this evening, we will deal with those first. So we'll first deal with 5.1 and then we'll go to 5.5. So 5.1 is number 64 Cleaver Street, West Perth, proposed 11 multiple dwellings. Um, council members, questions on this item? Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, I have a few. Um, firstly, well, I'll ask in the way that it was that it was asked by the last uh, speaker this evening, because it's a, I suppose, a summation of some of the questions that I had. So the question that was asked was, what does the proposal include that offsets uh, the departures from the acceptable development cr uh, criteria? And I think specifically in relation to height boundary wall size and the reduced setbacks to the northern boundary, please. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, in terms of what the development um, provides to offset each of those departures that are sought, uh, I'll just refer to the boundary wall height. Uh, while the proposal initially, when it was advertised, uh, was three odd stories in terms of the boundary wall height um, and it was and it appeared uh, to be green um, and quite vibrant uh, that design was yet to be f to finalized um, that has since changed through the design review process that's ultimately one story in height now uh, that's a modification that occurred subsequent to the advertising period and obtaining further comments uh, Aside from that, um, there are departures sought. So the boundary wall itself complies with the with the requirements, with the standards applicable. In terms of the building height and the um, side setback requirements, uh, ultimately it's gone through the design review panel to uh, flesh out any offsets, which is um, colours, material, setting back the upper storeys. Um, and that provides relief in terms of bulk and scale as it appears to the adjoining northern uh, northern boundary. Uh, and in terms of the uh, overall built form outcome, I guess there is no technical requirement to provide a community benefit or such. Um, each departure is required to be considered on its own merits um, uh, against applicable requirements. Um, I've got a few questions through you, Madam Mayor, if that's okay. So uh, it's noted in terms of the solar access and daylight um, Nil dwellings have living rooms and private open space obtaining two hours of direct northern sunlight. 100% of dwellings receive no direct northern sunlight. Uh, obviously, there's a design decision to place the stairwell on the northern boundary. Within, it's also within the setback. Uh, I understand the impact potentially of having built form within the set within the setback. But given slight as it is, uh, where the, the proposal is over plot ratio. Uh, it's over height in the front uh, portion of the development by storeys, but it's over height in, even in the smaller building to the rear at the three storeys. And the decision to place things like stairwells at the northern side and provide no access. So aside from the 
concerns of the, the uh, current occupants to the north, the actual future occupants of the development, I'm interested as to why it was considered an acceptable outcome, regardless of what they initially came, uh, came with. I understand it's been changed through what the applicant described as a lengthy process, but effectively a, an east-west facing site in, in its length, providing nil uh, northern sunlight access to any of its future occupants and a reduced northern boundary setback. I'm curious as to why that's believed to be a, an acceptable outcome for the, for the proposal. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, ultimately, that was a design um, outcome based on this site context, which is to the north you have a significant development, uh, eight storeys in height, and uh, accounting for um, the overshadowing to the south, which significantly affects this property. Uh, all of, if there were to be uh, major openings provided to that northern boundary for this particular development, um, that would ultimately be overshadowed uh, as a development outcome. So that is a challenge and that is a constraint of the site. The applicant has, um, in working with the uh, city's design review panel and obtaining that feedback, um, looked at ways to um, provide opportunities for major openings provided on other faces and frontages of the development to have regard for this issue. Um, as well as designing the, um, the development so that there is bin stores and storage rooms, um, non-active uses along that northern side um, because ultimately it will be overshadowed. So trying to locate active spaces um, where there will be some um, exposure to sunlight. In addition, uh, there, as uh, one of the res residents already explained earlier tonight, uh, there is an interface issue in terms of potentially overlooking from the existing residents on 66 Cleaver. Um, so again, that needs to be mitigated by removing um, uh, major openings and active spaces. Um, thank you. The, just for my clarity, the eight metre setback um, with the, the representation of the um, Cleaver Court property being set back eight metres from the boundary, is that to the building itself or is that uh, to the ground floor courtyards. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, that's the buildings itself. Okay, and the courtyards approximately five metres setback. Is that correct? But there, but there, but the courtyards are only on the ground floor. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's my understanding. Yes, can confirm. Um, but there is, in addition, um, landscape and existing trees along that boundary. Okay, and assuming the site's 50 odd metres deep, approximately 20 metres, the rear 20 metres of the site, uh, in a direct line, I understand obviously vision isn't direct north south, but uh, it's effectively unencumbered by the overshadowing issues from the, from the north. There's approximately 20 metres to the rear of the site, so the ha half of the three storey section uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be overshadowed at all from the northern. Uh, from the existence of the northern property. So I'm on page, well, page 26 is where I'm looking at. So uh, where it says proposed residential development from the word D to the right effectively uh, is uh, not encumbered by the building to the north. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. Uh, uh, as an approximation, it's probably about a third of the site to the rear. Um, is not affected. Cool. Right. And just a um, couple of questions from the gallery. I know the answers are probably good to have them answered because we can only ask questions. Uh, so can we get some comments from you in relation to property values and their uh, place in planning consideration? Also, uh, the, the uh, um, R codes part two or the apartment guidelines uh, deal with views of significance because that has changed from what the R codes, uh, volume one previously, uh, dealt with uh, so property values R codes and also um, I'll leave that for now if we can just get some comment around those two things please. Through you Mayor Cole, uh, under the planning framework um, there's a number of considerations um, that you need to have regard for in making a, a decision. Um, property values and uh, loss of value ultimately is not a relevant planning consideration. Might be a, a consideration absolutely if you were the owner, um, but it is not a, uh, a relevant planning consideration. Uh, as far as uh, views of significance, 
that is not identified as a neither an acceptable outcome standard or um, referenced as a performance assessment under R codes volume two, which deals with apartments. Um, in saying that, uh, I'm not aware of any SAT, uh, previous SAT determinations that has tested this since the R codes volume two has been in effect uh, since last year. Um, however, uh, there have been other decisions made that basically refer to the fact that uh, the principle is really around um, sharing of views and nobody owns a view um, and everybody probably has different view, uh, views on what is a significant view in itself. Uh, ultimately though, um, that is not embedded in the planning framework uh, to be a reason for refusal. Um, and one for you to perhaps take on notice, if that's okay, during the consult, if you can let us know during consultation around uh, the um, for probably TPS2 would be it, or the, uh, whether the local planning strategy and the, the heights, because R80 under the R codes is allowed four storeys as of right, but we had restricted this area to three storeys. Uh, if we can get some information as to whether there were any submissions from in and around the area at the time in relation to the three storey height limit and how that relates to R80, I understand that there was some can't make comment, I can wait till next week, but if we can get some information, please, about any submissions that were made uh, either seeking greater or seeking lesser or supporting the three-storey height limit in the R80, uh, this particular part of Cleaver Street, but the, the non-R50 areas of uh, the Cleaver Precinct, please. OK, councillors, Councillor Hallett. Thank you, through the Mayor to the um, Manager. Just wondering if you can clarify, um, because the development application went through a few iterations with the design review panel um, and the original consultation was on the first um, iteration, can you talk us through to the extent in which, I guess, subsequent um, versions were communicated to the community so that the community is, um, I guess, certain that they're commenting on the most recent um, version and um, any fears that things that have already been changed um, can be alleviated. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, you're right. Uh, ultimately, uh, some of the community members are referring to the proposal that was advertised some time ago. It has gone through a number of iterations. Uh, in saying that a judgment call needs to be made in terms of the modifications made, being if the modifications created greater departures or um, further uh, uh, some would say variations to the uh, deemed to comply standards, then that would be um, re advertised. Now, all of the modifications that have been made since the initial consultation period have been trying to address those concerns and trying to reduce, I suppose, the departures and modify the proposal in that way and take on board the design review panel feedback. Um, so, on that basis, the judgment call was made that um, consultation was not. Um, undertaken again based on the final iteration that's been before you. Uh, we have included an attachment of the version that was advertised initially as well as the plans that uh, are before you for final determination. Just, is there, and this may be on notice or for just future discussion, um, is there a way in which local residents would be able to access subsequent versions um, online or some other format not just when it comes out in the briefing paper? Do you, Mayor Cole, happy to take that on notice? Councillors, questions? Um, Acting Director, one of the questions that has come up quite a bit this evening is about the impact of overshadowing on the southern neighbours' properties. Um, I was just wondering whether it would be possible to have the we have any overshadowing diagram included in um, the plans, but could that actually demonstrate um, the, the neighbouring property, including the outline of the property and the courtyard areas? And also, would it be possible to get a comparative overshadowing diagram where there are three metre setback and a three storey front building, just as a comparison to demonstrate the additional impact through the variations? 
Happy to arrange that, Mayor Cole. Thank you. And so just also, I think just in response to what Councillor Hallett was speaking about, there was some concerns um, from Glenda McCormack about the parapet wall. I think it was Glenda, perhaps I've got that wrong. Um, could we just get some feedback from you on the parapet wall? I think that um, that issue is one of the issues that may have been resolved through the DRP process. Happy to confirm that to you, Mayor Cole, in the briefing notes. Um, I briefly touched on that before. Uh, ultimately, the parapet wall um, has now reduced in height to one storey, which is in strict compliance with the acceptable outcome standard. Thank you. Just making sure we got everything covered off here in terms of any other questions and comments. Um, just, I think also just following up, I do note that the decision was taken not to re-advertise because the DRP process was to respond to concerns raised by um, neighbouring residents, but I do think it would be helpful to somehow think about how that could be provided in advance if we're not going to advertise once those plans are finalised, it would be good to be able to give residents more time to be able to consider that. So perhaps we can have a bit more of a discussion about how that, could, how that process could work. So, council members, are there any further questions? Councillor Fatakis. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Through you, Mayor. Um, I just want to touch on um, just one po point that came up in some of the DRP um, meetings was relating to the trees that exist um, on the northern boundary, quite significant trees. And the, um, the comment um, from the DRP was regarding uh, concern on impact of construction on... Um, the tree root zone and um, the uh, suggestion of getting an independent assessment um, to ensure that con uh, construction doesn't have any impact on that. Can I get some comments on that, please? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, ultimately, that's a consideration at the detailed um, construction stage and that needs to be planned for. Uh, what we can do is, uh, through the briefing notes, we can touch base with the applicant and obtain a little bit more information around how they intend to address that matter. Um, just also, too, I just noticed on the plans that um, two car charging stations have been included, and I, I love the, the foresight to and the commitment to electric vehicles, but with such a small amount of dwellings, I'm trying to understand um, where that sits, whether that's additional sustainability um, considerations that have been given, but um, was there any indication of why there were two car charging stations actually in, uh, to be installed in this such a small development? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, my understanding is that's the initiative of the applicant. Ultimately, there are a number of sustainability measures that need to be delivered. Um, that's the expectation from Council and embedded in our uh, policy framework. Um, that is just one initiative, um, I suppose, that the applicant has taken up, um, and that's just their prerogative. Um, no objection from City's administration in regards to that. And um, through you, Mayor, again, um, just with regards to the landscaping, um, I just also um, noted a comment from the DRP that they felt that the landscaping um, undercover was tokenistic. Um, just want to really get, get uh, some understanding whether those small areas were um, uh, included in the calculations on deep soil. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, no, they weren't, they were those ones that were referred to as tokenistic. Ultimately, uh, there is adequate deep soil um, provision on site, um, and in terms of its placement, it's been strategically located towards uh, or within this, uh, the front setback area, as well as to the rear to provide that separation to the northern boundary that experiences some access to northern sunlight. Um, as well as to the southern boundary, and there's also some landscaping trellis to the southern boundary. So uh, the portions that were considered tokenistic, I guess, do not form part of the deep soil calculations. Councillor Lowden. 
Thank you. Um, one of the conditions on this is um, a requirement to meet universal access requirements. I think it's 20% of apartments to be silver and 5% to be platinum level in terms of their access. It's, to be honest, not something I'm familiar with. What sort of modifications are going to be required to achieve those outcomes? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, yeah, obviously uh, that's something that's been introduced into ARCO's Volume 2, so it's um, relatively new in that, in that sense. Ultimately, it's about uh, ensuring that people with disabilities or limited mobility can age in place and accounting for that um, at the de development stage. So uh, it's trying to improve that functionality. So ultimately, it relates to internal modifications. So it won't impact on the external of the building. It won't require an additional DA. It just needs to be demonstrated that you can do initiatives such, a, such as um, step-free dwellings, a certain number, um, also the ability to install um, some like grab rails and there's sufficient areas um, in the wet spaces as well. So those are some of those initiatives that could be delivered, um, but that just needs to be demonstrated through a, a separate, um, I guess, detailed explanation. Thank you. Um, just to also on the, um, the life cycle analysis, there's sort of, there seems to be two parts going on here. One is around the built form and the the Nathers rating, which I think was set at 6.5, but then there's also an LCA uh, that demonstrates a 50% reduction in global warming potential, um, which is primarily achieved through a six-star Nathers rating, solar panels, and instant hot water. So those those two parts both form part of uh, the acceptable outcomes. Is that correct? To you, Mayor Cole, I might take that on notice. I just want to clarify those two elements that you're referring to. Nuthurst, definitely. I'll just clarify the other point. I just note that there's, um, it mentions in one point that it's going to achieve 6.5 uh, Nathas rating, um, but the LCA refers to a Nathas of 6, so I wasn't clear on which of the two they were aiming to achieve. And that, because this is all part of the, the applica applicant's approval, we have the the solar panels on the actual plans, they then also form, they are a requirement of that this will, if, it, if this is built, we will see those on the development, they will, will achieve those outcomes. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Sorry, just to um, expand on um, an earlier question, um, the manager referred to. Um, financial value of um, adjacent properties as being not a relevant planning consideration. I'm just wondering if maybe we could expand on that a little bit for viewers and um, folks in the gallery in terms of what are the actual implications of um, council using such a thing to refuse a, a development application and what, what might happen um, in terms of the legal framework. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, if, you, if council was to refuse the application based on value of properties, uh, that would be embedded in the decision itself. If the applicant was to appeal that decision to the State Administrative Tribunal, um, that would go through an uh, appeals process um, in which the reasons for refusal will be fleshed out, uh, which would include um, loss of value of properties and uh, ultimately the same planning framework applies in that appeals process, so you may, you would may, um, you may well see a reconsideration uh, for that application. Now, given that loss of value is not embedded in the same planning framework that would be considered through the SAT process, um, my suggestion is that that the decision wouldn't stand, um, and ultimately, I guess, if it went to a full hearing, um, it would be unlikely that the uh, that the application would be refused on the basis of that. It's just not a relevant planning consideration. Councillors, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, just one last, if we can get some comments in the briefing notes, please. Just in relation to the local, or the, the um, uh, materials and colours and the referencing of uh, the local context. Um, other than, uh, if we can get some confirmation what the proposed material is for the front balconies, 
place, the west-facing balconies. They appear to be somewhat obscured in the front block perspective, uh, which is on page 42. Uh, but if you look somewhere further down the track, they appear to be quite translucent, so just get some clarity over whether they will be visually permeable um, and what to what degree, and also uh, other than the white render and the... Um, use of uh, exposed um, brick material, whether uh, how the form, including the, the windows, the design, the, uh, the way that they sit within the development as well, how they reference uh, the local context at all. And then another question, which is not directly related to the DA, but broadly related, because we've got all of the plans and the applicant submission as it was previously submitted and what's currently being looked at. And in some cases, the date stamp of the 8th doesn't appear and then three pages later it does appear. It makes it very confusing. So if we can just make sure that we're very clear when elected members get out or the, when the agenda is published, what is actually the plans that are being considered and anything that's not being considered be separated clearly uh, because at the moment the previous submissions and some of the applicant submissions sit alongside the development plans that are for consideration. So if we could get that for future DAs, that would be great. Thank you. Just on that, I have to agree. I think it's quite confusing that um, that it really needs to be very clearly watermarked or that the plans that are no longer under consideration need to re be very clear that they're um, no longer under consideration, not just through the date stamp, but also just very clearly, because I think if you're if you're flicking through this and you see that um, what's been referred to through um, through the public gallery tonight, when you look at the the high green um, <clears throat> parapet wall, which has now been significantly reduced, it does need to be very clear that that's no longer under consideration. If we could mark them out, um, look, I do question sometimes whether we even need to have previous plans. I think in this case, because the the current plans weren't advertised, I think there's grounds for that. But sometimes I do question whether we need the copies of each iteration of each plan, because I understand that's a working process. But council is determining the plans that are before us, and in some ways, what's come before is a bit of a moot point when it gets to this point. In this case, it's a bit of an exception because it wasn't re-advertised. Um, Councillor Gonczewski. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, if I could just get some more detailed comments on the um, DRP review of the plans provided or the proposal provided on the 8th of January 2020 in, um, that was reviewed on the 13th of the 1st. Just in terms of the amendments that were made um, in relation to the, um, to address a principle six in relation to amenity, um, in the report, it talks about amenity in relation to the boundary walls, but in the previous, um, and uh, it talks about ventilation. But I'm just wondering um, if, for the, um, if we could get specific comment, if, if in the briefing notes we could get specific comment in relation to the um, comments raised at the minutes, if the November meeting, um, if we could have the um, January comments following on from that, so we can sort of track to see that those, um, all of those have been addressed um, or that there has been a consideration of that in the subsequent uh, design presented in January. That would be great too, just to make it a little easier to follow. Through you, Mayor Cole, can I just clarify, is it for all of the, um, the principles uh, or are you more interested in the amenity? Um, I guess primarily the ones that are still remaining orange would be great. Councillors, Councillor Smith. Um, just through you, Mayor Cole, just following on from um, Councillor Toppelberg's comments and yourself, um, and the, one of the questions from the gallery, I think from Glenda, regarding the, the, um, the north elevation of the, <clears throat> of the building with the green bright green circles on the facade um, that I'm looking at at page 57. I am presuming that that is part of the old plans. Is that correct? And no longer exists on the new? I just thought we might be able to clear that up for the gallery tonight. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, that's correct. It no longer forms part of the proposal. Thank you. 
So, uh, Councillor Smith, have you finished? Councillor Wallace? Um, through you, Macola. Uh, my question was just about the design review panel process for Principle 1. Uh, we started off at DRP 1 with not supported and ended up at supported. Um, just provide some discussion about uh, what changed over the course of that process and how the final determination of supported was made. Principle 1 being context and character. Through you, Mayor Cole, happy to provide that in briefing notes. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, thank you very much. Quite a few questions on this item this evening, and as mentioned before, if you'd like to seek a site meeting before next Tuesday, please do let me know. Um, we'll then move on to item 5.5, .5, which was the second item raised this evening, which is amendment number four to local planning policy number 7.5.15, character retention areas and heritage areas to include guidelines for the Boulevard, Kalgoorlie Street and Buxton Street. Councillor Gonshevsky. I just had a question in relation to the... Um, now, hold on, I'm going to have to get there. There was uh, the second story setback provision talks about the placement of the setback, I think, in the um, middle or the rear of the block. Um, I note from the Harley Street guidelines that um, they talk about the visibility of the second story from the street and have a more specific provision in relation to um, the distance from the, I think it's the front of the street or the front of the dwelling. And I was just one, wanting to get some information as to um, why a more general provision was considered to be included in this case and, and how that um, might impact on, um, I guess, development in relation to the visibility of, um, you know, two-storey um, extensions or, I guess, second-storey developments as new builds? Through you, Cole. Essentially, the upper floor setback for the Mount Hawthorne precinct has to apply to three different streets. So it is a little bit more, little bit more generic in nature, um, but it does also... So what it says is two-storey development is to be located in the middle or rear third of the lot. Um, and what that does is give it, I guess, a bit more of a consistent setback where the ground floor isn't consistent. Um, in somewhere like Harley Street, where the ground floor is mostly consistent, having a two-metre setback from that means the upper floor is also going to be consistent. Um, but in a lot of Mount Hawthorne, the setbacks are not as consistent. And so this ensures the upper floor at least is. Um, but through the consultation, we'll, um, we'll probably go into a bit of detail on that one and, and see what the, what the community thinks about it and, yeah, happy to modify as well. Was there any consideration in, in terms of crafting the, the wording around the visibility from the streetscape in relation to the second story? I think, um, it, I guess, no, I won't comment, but um, just that uh, I know that that was raised within the community forum. Yeah, so that one is more encompassed in the local housing objective in the left-hand column. Uh, where first floor development is to be adequately set back to maintain the predominant single storey appearance of the streetscape. So if you don't do it in the middle or rear third of the lot, um, you can still put it in the, in the front third, basically, if it's maintaining that single storey appearance. So if you can't see it as much or if it's not a huge impact. And if you're putting the, um, the upper storey in the middle or the rear of the, the lot, that's the actual lot size, not the placement of the dwelling. So you could put your second story in the middle, uh, in the, um, it, the, your second story could be directly on top of your first story as long as you had a reasonably significant front setback um, in your um, development, whether that's an original house or um, new, new build. Through Mac Hall, yes, that's correct. Councillor Castle. Through you, Mac Cole. Um, yes, I just have a question um, in relation to the comments made in the gallery. Both um, residents were from Matlock Street. Now, my understanding is that after the nominations from the Boulevard Kalgoorlie and a por portions of the Boulevard Kalgoorlie and Buxton, um, that consultation was 
taken, uh, was done with other surrounding streets. Can you just give us some clarity on which parts of Matlock and other streets in Mount Hawthorne were also consulted um, and how we came to the conclusion that we would just proceed with the original three seat streets? Through you, Cole. We consulted on the entirety of Matlock from Britannia to Scarborough Beach and Seabrook, um, which is the entirety of Seabrook from Britannia to Anzac Road, and then Coogee as well from Anzac Road to Scarborough Beach. So essentially those two parallel streets all the way from Scarborough Beach Road down to Britannia. Um, we included those because of our initial... Um, survey that we did, uh, showing them as um, generally intact streets. Um, Matlock in particular was highly intact. Um, so throughout the, or at the first workshop that we did with the community, uh, we didn't get a lot of people from Matlock and Coogee attending. Um, we also did a further letter drop and email survey to see if they wanted to provide their comments um, in writing rather than attending the workshop and still didn't get much support for those streets. So determined that at this stage, we wouldn't have the ability under the policy to proceed with them um, because we do require at least 40% of the owner's support to proceed with a nomination. Um, if that changes between either now and the council meeting or even by the end of advertising, we can make modifications to the policy um, as um, as the community intends, really. And, and just to clarify for the community that if that changes at any point in the future, that process can also proceed in those areas if there's enough support to, to take it to the next stage? Yes, through you, Nicole. And we would also probably be seeking to do additional marketing and things around what does get approved through this process. So even if it's not Matlock, at this stage, it may be the next street that we that we look at to actually try and drive um, that from our perspective, rather than being a resident-led initiative. Um, and I just have a question around on page two fifty six, section four of the setbacks of garages and carports. Um, so four point one. 04.1 refers to carports and garages should be located so as to maintain the absence of car parking facilities within the streetscape. Can you just give some clarity on what you propose? Um, and tied in with that is C4.1 um, that states that it would be deemed to comply if those carports or garages are at the rear of the property where available. Is, is that... Um, does that reflect the, the feedback that we received from the community? Through Mayor Cole, I think mostly, um, mostly it does. A lot of the comments were around the impact of garages, um, especially roller doors, double, uh, double width garages. Um, this provision itself is um, pretty much as per the R codes anyway. Um, and I guess by putting it in here, uh, we're just kind of reaffirming that um, that's the position and we'll clarify that further through the, through the community consultation as well if it's um, not all carports, just garages and not all hard stand, um, just garages, because that is what exists yeah, that's already. Yeah, that was my next question, is, is if through this process um, we felt it was better, it better reflected if carports and garages were dealt with separately. Um, that's something that could come out of that next consultation process. Yep. Just to follow up on that question, because I had the same question about whether the feedback, and the feedback talks about vehicle dominance, I think the wording is, but um, I wasn't entirely sure whether the feedback was saying that the issue was with garage doors with you know, solid garage doors with roller doors as opposed to carports. And one of the questions I have is that, you know, if we do go out on a, on a process that says that you may no longer be able to have hard stand or carports where that wasn't identified as the issue, do we potentially lose the momentum for the project? Um, we have 
dealt with this previously when we talked about whether you have an existing crossover versus when you don't have an existing crossover. So if there is an existing crossover in place but no carport or hard stand, would this um, provision still mean that that could not be put in place? Through Macol, uh, the the essential objective of the policy is to establish what we actually want to see in future in the area. So um, a lot of the arguments around whether there's something in place now or whether something was approved prior, we'll probably try to avoid that and just come up with what the community actually wants to see existing there. And if it's that it is no carports and no cars out the front, even verge parking and that kind of thing can dominate quite a bit, um, then we'll try to establish that through the policy. Uh, I don't think it's going to impact the momentum of the project at all. Um, if anything, I think it's um, probably positive that it's written in a strong way. Um, it'll definitely get a lot of comments that we are actually seeking. So, yeah. We may actually get the response we've been seeking. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions whilst we're talking about that. In the absence of this policy, if someone puts in an application tomorrow <coughs> to put a carport in the front setback, uh, or where they have a crossover or otherwise, if they have access to a right of way, am I not correct that the R codes say they can't do it anyway? It's only this is only just reiterating an existing provision, which means that on any of these streets they would not be allowed to put a carport or garage as of right in there uh, at the front of the property if they have rear access. Through Macol, not entirely. There's a number of other considerations that need to go into it when considering just from the R codes perspective. Um, the, the main issue is that those streets, or say this street in particular, if an application came in and we didn't have the character retention policy, then we haven't got an established position of what the character is and what the character should be of the area. So if there is already a number of crossovers or a number of carports in the front, that may be established as the predominant streetscape style, which the R codes refers to a lot. Um, through this policy, we'll be looking not just at the predominant style, but the intended style, and that may be no carports or no crossovers. Council, uh, yeah, yeah, so a couple more. Um, the... Uh, where are we? Sorry. Um, the development objectives, so this is would be on page 255, uh, talks about the retention of visual character of late 19th to early 20th, to early 20th century. Do we, are we aware of any 19th century properties in any of the streets in the area? I'll have to take that on notice, thanks. Thank you. Um, and the primary, well the first objective listed, it's not the primary, but the first dot point is retention and conservation of original dwellings. Given that it's not, this is about character retention, not heritage, or other, is the is that objective intended to be met by making the provisions around new build such that where possible renovation or uh, maintaining at least the street front of the original dwelling would be encouraged because the uh, the, the built form we we'll call it a burden or the built form impact of the guidelines would otherwise mean that you would largely need to not necessarily replicate but reference so much of it that it would be a strong consideration because obviously there's no element in here which we, such as no demolition without DA or otherwise so there's no provisions related to demolition so I'm just making sure that I'm reading it correctly that that, that objective is met by making it difficult or uninviting to knock down unless you absolutely have to. Through Macol, yes I think that's a reasonable explanation of how that objective is met. Like you say, there's no regulatory mechanism with which we can retain and conserve the original dwellings, but um, the type of development outcome that we are seeking definitely lends itself to an owner um, retaining the original dwelling to, to get that outcome. And so where we talk about um, the... Uh, where are we? Sorry, the general building design, uh, so C7.1, the built form of any new dwelling, oh, sorry, C7.2, the materials of any new dwellings as viewed from the street shall be consistent with the prevailing materials of the streetscape. Uh, we've seen examples 
perhaps in item 5.1 this evening where uh, white render and white render can be argued by an applicant as being referencing the materials uh, that currently exist. Um, how, I guess I, as asked, is, are we missing an opportunity to be more nuanced, for example, where you have uh, timber windows that are recessed that have uh, um, that are uh, the, the way in which they are constructed uh, within the space, uh, the, the, the the volume and the shape of things like render, for example, so where you have um, rendered uh, 35 degree pitched um, gables, etc., reads rather differently to white render on a uh, on a, a different design or a larger expanse. Is that something that should be borne out from within the, poli the policy, or is that the are we comfortable at C7.2 and O7.2 uh, provides enough guidance so that we don't end up arguing that uh, aluminium windows stuck inside a rendered square is referencing the local materials because there's a window and a white rendered frontage, for example? Through you, Cole, I think that's probably um, another thing that's um, probably not as nuanced as it could be because of the fact that it's applying to those three streets, generally they're the same kind of housing form, but there are differences across them. Um, so this is one that I would hope to get a bit more detail on through the um, community consultation and when we host an info session we might go into a bit of a bit more detail on that and actually see what people value about those about those character homes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a question on given the um, rising interest on Matlot Street, and I just want to um, be clear for those people who are really keen to, to move forward with an inclusion. Um, have we got an idea really in terms of numbers and dates that um, residents can actually aim for? I mean, if we're looking at the probably ideal situation where they can get included in on this policy, what are we looking at or is that, that not possible? Three, you, Mac Hole. Um, as for numbers and dates, if we get a nomination before the council meeting next week, we can include that into, um, into the policy. We would need 40% support of a particular stretch of a street. Um, so we would normally try to do at least a block um, from one street to another. So gentleman before um, does have uh, allegedly enough for, for a block. Um, and if we were to do any more, then we would, we would need more from further up. And we can also accept them even throughout the whole process, really, um, during the advertising. We are still going to advertise to those other streets that were included. So we'll, we'll let them know that this is what's happening on, um, on Boulevard and Kalgoorlie and Buxton. And if they want to be involved, then we do need those actual, that actual 40% support for the, for the street. And even after it's all finished, um, like I said before, we will um, try to actually drive it ourselves a little to, um, to get that support. And that could be, um, you know, it could be for Matlock or Coogee or it could be in other areas across the city. Thank you, Mayor. And um, just uh, following on from that, so is there a possibility within um, the consultation, I know it's being advertised, to have um, a meeting um, involving uh, residents, saying that, um, you know, I was, have to say I was personally um, surprised to not see a, a big representation at the community consultation that was done at the Lesser Hall, but um, is there, have we got provision within the time or the resources to be able to consider that? Through Mayor Cole, yes, we're doing another info session and we'll invite every, all the same people again. Thank you. And just um, lastly, it's just referencing um, just the comments from the gallery in terms of the, um, the council's um, lack of um, action or consultation when it comes to uh, demolition of houses. Can I just get some comments on that, please? Sorry, could you clarify, please, are you saying that the comment that a precedent has already been set with the houses that have been lost? Um, no, sorry. Um, it's just with regards to um, houses being demolished without consultation with the neighbours. Through Mac Hole, we are also, um, our team is also amending the 
um, community consultation policy at this stage, so we'll be reviewing all of those requirements um, as well. Councillor Fatakis, are you referring to no um, to demolition without a DA, the Correct. change to the regulations that occurred in 2015? 15. 15? Yeah. So that consultation is no longer required to demolish a single residential home, which is an issue that we have been trying to grapple with. Thank you, Mayor. That's, um, I think that um, just the comments this evening showed that there wasn't that understanding about those changes, even though they were done um, in 2015, that we're, we're still feeling the effects of, um, of that uh, change in policy. Thank you. I'll take that as a question. Um, on that, I do have a question about whether we can... The issue of no demolition without DA is unresolved. Um, we have been trying to work on this through the inner city mayor's group and that's probably a long work in progress. So I think um, I was considering uh, either asking what you think of this or flagging an amendment to see whether we could at least um, move forward with approaching the department on including um, no demolition without DA in our character retention area policy and in our scheme. Um, I know that we should do these things holistically and look at the whole provision, but I think that this is something that we really should potentially consider if we can. Um, so seeking your advice on that um, and just flagging that I may um, put forward an amendment for that provision to be considered to move forward um, separately even. Through Macaul, yep, happy to provide that in the briefing notes. Thank you. Um, Councillor Castle. Through you, Mac, I'll just sorry, one more question in relation to the consultation. Um, you've already given some of the detail of how that's going to work with an info session. I'm just wondering, can you give some detail about how this proposed amendment will be presented to the community? Because um, I'm just seeking some reassurance that they will understand there's opportunities to vary those those um, particular provisions as opposed to it being a like or dislike vote um, from the community and that um, you know they don't see that as an as a, a done deal through Mayor Cole, yes I'll provide that in the briefing notes if that's okay can I just add further to that one of the questions I was going to ask about um, I think we are having issues getting our community to engage with p words on a page, which is perhaps not as... I mean, we have a very... This is not to be disrespectful to our community who are highly educated and professional, etc., as we all know, um, but could we perhaps give some visual representation of what these provisions um, may look like, whether it's graphics or whether it's actually photos of homes that are good examples of what you know, on those streets of what it is that's sort of setting the example so that, um, you know, we're quite used to reading about top of external walls and concealed walls and pitched roofs, but there's, you know, it can be very easily conveyed graphically. So that could that potentially be used as part of the advertising of the provisions as well as in consultation? Yes, through Macaul, definitely planning on doing that and may even include them in the final policy that comes back. Um, in a couple of months. Thank you, councillors. Any further questions on this one, Councillor Smith? Thank you. Um, it's just a question regarding future buyers into an area that has now that has been deemed um, that has the character retention. How would they know that the potential home that they're looking at is within this area, was in within the area, and that they might have some restrictions regarding what they could do? I'll take that on notice, that's okay, thanks. Signage saying welcome to this amazing character attention area. <laughs> I don't think we've, well, it's a very good question because I don't think we've done that on our other heritage or character streets, have we? No. Good question. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on. So they were the two items that were raised by members of the public gallery this evening, 5.1 and 5.5. So we'll go back 
to the remainder of items on the agenda and move through them sequentially. So 5.2, 392 Fitzgerald Street, proposed change of use to cafe, restaurant and shop, amendment to approvals for an unauthorised existing development. Councillor Hallett. Um, just a slightly tangential question um, from this. I'm just wondering if you could clarify the change from um, TPS 1 to 2 um, and the use of um, non-medical consulting um, rooms, and that's become, a, I guess, listed as a service in a shop. Um, can you just clarify what remains as medical, clinical uses versus what are non-medical and therefore just considered a service? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, when this was determined previously, it was under TPS 1, and uh, TPS 1, uh, the shop definition at the time didn't allude, or didn't include, um, I guess, uh, services on a, of a personal nature. It's just basically the sale, retail sale of goods. Um, so ultimately it was an unlisted use. It was treated as unlisted use. We, had a, uh, we have a um, uh, consultancy... Uh, policy and under that uh, it's non-medical. That's how it was treated previously. We've had a change to our scheme and uh, the shop definition has changed and it includes um, services of a personal nature. So ultimately it now fits within that defined term of shop. So as part of this decision which is being made under the current planning framework, um, the, the use itself needs to align to the, that defined term and just to follow up, um, and so, and what would be the um, a layman response to um, how we would define a medical um, use versus a personal use? Let me take that on notice, and I'll give you a layman response. Councillors, Councillor Vitakis. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just uh, with regards to the car parking um, and the cash and loo um, payment, I noticed um, on our approval on the 12th of December there was a condition for that um, approval noted the cash and loo prior to occupation or use, um, and in the report there is um, a reference to um, it being um, paid um, by a number of payments. Can I get a clarification on that, please? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, that's correct. So uh, Council's previous decision uh, required the operator to make a cash and loo payment of approximately 0 0.8 car base. Uh, ultimately, that condition has been satisfied um, by the applicant entering into a payment plan with the city that payment plan, though, has not concluded. They haven't paid that full amount of 0 0.8. So on that basis, um, that condition is recommended to be uh, or remain as part of this amendment um, to ensure that the remainder of that cash in lieu contribution as required under Council's previous decision um, remains at play. Um, so just to, to clarify, um, even though the approval at Council was for, um, there wasn't uh, an option for um, a schedule of payments, that's just normal practice for, for that to actually occur. Um, can you just um, explain that to me, why the full amount wasn't paid up front? Through you, Mayor Cole, the satisfaction of the condition is the it is the payment, but they do have that option, as with a number of our fees and charges, of entering a payment plan if they can't pay it immediately. Uh, thank you. Um, just also want to get some understanding as to the use of various um, areas within that lot, um, the plans that uh, that were approved. Is there any intention to um, amend 
uh, the plans and the use of areas like the footspar area um, and that um, being amended for use for, for tables um, and uh, if that's possible um, and in the event that the applicant uh, wants to make any amendments, what's the process moving forward? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, ultimately the applicant is not seeking to amend um, the operation internally, including the foot spars that you're referring to. Um, what they are seeking to do is uh, get a use approval um, for that shop because the previous approval by council was only for a 12-month period. So ultimately it's a use approval intensification of the site is not being proposed as part of this. This is just ultimately to extend um, the operation that's currently occurring on site. Um, the front portion, I'll just note, uh, has previously been approved for that cafe use under delegation. This will basically just allow both of those aspects of the premises to just operate moving forward. And lastly, um, through you, Mayor, uh, just uh, looking at um, compliance, um, just that change of um, consideration as pers from medical um, consulting rooms to personal use, um, does that have any impact on, on um, incline, uh, compliance, considering that, um, and I no noticed that um, when it did actually come through, we did have some note of concern about um, the interaction of uh, a foot spa business with, uh, with food. Through you, Mayor Cole, again, the operation is not changing. Um, ultimately, uh, a number of approvals need to be obtained as part of this process. Um, I can clarify whether a health approval would be required um, in relation to the proximity, I guess, of that uh, foot spa and, and the food being served. Uh, and given that there is um, a new use approval being issued now, I can clarify that and provide that in the briefing notes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's just more of a clarification on whether that, that change meant that um, there was a bit of a loophole. Um, just understanding, reading through the notes, that um, there have been a number of compliance inspections already done. Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. There have been um, ongoing inspections undertaken by the health team. Uh, no issues in terms of its operation since it's, since it's been there. Thank you. Just in relation to the conditions around the interaction of the um, uh, business to the street, I note that in the previous approval the condition um, was, I think condition three, was uh, wordier than the current, um, current approval and I think specifically talks about internal or, hold on, where are we? talks about um, curtains, blinds and other internal or external treatments that obscure the view of the internal area from Fitzgerald Street not being permitted to be used during the hours of the development operation. Um, could you please provide some comment in relation to the new wording and um, confirm that the new wording catches um, the use of... I guess anything internal or external as opposed to just um, say tinted glass um, that may obscure the, the vision, uh, the interaction with the straight frontage? Through you, Mekol, I'll confirm that in the briefing notes. I believe um, that it's an unintended consequence of using like our standard conditions which have been modified, but I'll uh, investigate and provide that in briefing notes. Thanks. Um, I'll consider potentially putting forward an amendment to bring that uh, uh, the old wording back. Um, and then just also, if it's possible, to get an assessment as to whether the um, current operation is um, considered to be in compliance with that condition. That would be great. Councillors, any further questions? OK, we'll move on to 5.3, which is... 452 to 460 William Street, Perth, proposed alterations and additions to shop, unauthorised existing development. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, not that I'll move it, but can I request uh, an alternative be prepared uh, that would tie uh, through you, um, that would tie the um, Roller shutters, that's the word I was looking for, uh, or that would, would tie what, what has been applied for to the use 
uh, and limit the duration of the approval for five years, whichever is the sooner. So if the use was to cease within five years, it would have to stop. But if not, they still have to come back to council in five years. Uh, so if we can get an alternative prepared to that effect, that would be appreciated. Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Matt Collier. So I've got some questions about what is the, um, the practical implications of refusing this application. Is it correct to say without the shutters on the windows they cannot renew their licence? Through you, Mayor Cole, practical implications um, refers to, I guess, all of the factors at play, not just the planning decision before you. Um, there, are, there are other legislation that applies, um, um, WA Police, uh, and on that basis, if roller shutters were not approved, an alternate um, satisfactory uh, means to uh, securely store the ammunition as well as the firearms would need to be sought by the applicant um, and it would also result in the uh, roller shutters having to be removed. And um, do we have any information about what other options they might have to satisfy those requirements? Do they all relate to securing the um, external facade or are there other measures that uh, could take their place inside the building or in, you know, to secure the, the firearms. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, attachment number four refers to the firearm storage requirements and that's basically under the head of power um, of issuing that licence. So that's like a info sheet, if you will, for anybody looking to store firearms. Uh, in short, it sets out uh, I guess certain criteria. It doesn't specify these are the particular means to do so, so it doesn't say roller shutters or it doesn't say, you know, um, any other solution. It, in saying that, it does allude to cabinets or some sort of casing um, within the premises and how that could be stowed away. Uh, in saying that, that has been explored, as I understand it, with the, um, with the police confirming that that would be, that would prove to be a logistical um, issue for the for the operator, just because of the amount of firearms and and ammunition that would need to be stowed away, morning and in the evening after work shuts. So I guess that's that might be a, an issue um, in terms of satisfying these separate legislative requirements. And has the applicant indicated um, that they're prepared to consider some other op other options other than roller shutters, or are they sticking to their guns? <laughs> okay, the pun of the night competition has just emerged. Councillor Castle is out in front. To you, Mayor Cole, uh, as I understand, the preference of the applicant is to um, retain the roller shutters that have been erected. Councillors, Councillor Patakis. Yeah. Um, to that, that was um, helped answer my question with regards to alternatives. Um, with regards to um, securing um, securing the the shop, um, it's just my understanding that um, is a combination of both securing uh, the armoury um, and the ammunition as well as um, looking at access to um, to the shop or were the concerns in terms of the licence um, only with regards to um, uh, how the uh, the arms were, were to, uh, stored. Through you, Mayor Cole, if I understand the question correctly, um, I think it's a bit about both in terms of securing the premises in which you would have firearms and ammunition. So uh, to satisfy that, um, there needs to be some sort of containment up to a certain specification as set out by the police. Councillors? Um, 
Sorry, Sorry Michael, Councillor thank Smith, you. you're going to have to put your hand up. I couldn't Sorry. tell that was you Sorry. actually wanted to speak then. I was turning away. <laughs> Apologies. Um, may I ask, if have, the, have there been any complaints regarding um, the installation of these from other businesses around? How, how did this become highlighted to administration? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, I'm not aware of any issues or complaints from uh, adjoining business businesses around uh, the installation of these uh, roller shutters. It came to the attention uh, of administration through a query um, as to whether these, uh, these additions um, had relevant approvals in place and investigation ensued. Thank you. Councillors, um, I'm just trying to understand from the information from the police that talks about cabinets, etc. So it's not really, it's quite different to having the ammunition in the windows. But is one of the issues the fact that the police do not want um, there to, to for people to actually see the ammunition and the and the arms, so that we, so that if you did have windows that were open and they remained there, if there was some type of different grill. Um, is the issue that they want that to actually be um, opaque and that you can't look into the window and actually visually see what's there? Through you, Mayor Cole. Sorry. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, I need to investigate and look into the, these firearms regulations and better understand that in terms of the purpose. Uh, again, it this information sheet that, I've, uh, that we've attached just alludes to the safe storage of the firearms. So if it's about um, being visible, um, I'm not sure and I can provide that in the briefing notes. Thank you. Also, the report says that this would set a precedent for the city. If it was tied to the use, how many other firearms dealers do we have in the city of Vincent? Through you, Mayor Cole, great question. I'll need to confirm. I'm not aware of any others. Um, and just do you have any comment on what the Heritage Council has put forward in that they have indicated that they support the roller shutters? Through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, um, there is some commentary in the report uh, from the Heritage Council on page 192. Uh, ultimately, they, the Heritage Council do acknowledge um, that it does or that it would result in a negative impact on the cultural significance um, of this particular place, uh, but also acknowledge that uh, the removal of those roller shutters ultimately is reversible and it wouldn't result in you know, permanent damage to the, to the building. And on that basis, they acknowledge why it's being installed and support it on that basis. And just confirming that that's gone to the Heritage Council um, proper and not, and the, or is that the view of the department? Do you recall it's gone to the Heritage Council? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. A um, couple of follow up questions. Uh, the. From a safety, I suppose, from a safety point of view, uh, well, sorry, I'll, I'll ask it in another. I'm trying to think of the right way to ask the question. Um, if somebody was to break into this premises uh, and it was well lit without roller shutters on the door, would it be reasonable to assume that passers-by or passive observers, uh, particularly as the two streets adjacent to it are now two-way? Uh, and given its location, uh, would be able to uh, have passive surveillance of the building and be able to see what is going on if the roller shutters were not present? My question to you is would you want to be present in that situation? <laughs> That's my first question. <laughs> Through you, Mayor Cole, in that scenario, um, I suppose there would be some surveillance and people observing that. I, I suppose the risk is um, that the nature of this use is that it's associated with firearms and, and ammunition. So, right. Can we perhaps get some information about any, uh, if there's been any uh, robberies or otherwise 
uh, this premises in the 50 odd years that it's been in business, and also whether the requirement of these mysterious roller shutters to hide what's inside, also whether the signage on the exterior of the building that says firearms and ammunition is also to be covered uh, for the same duration of time under the police requirements. You might be looking for a particular model. Um, thank you. Any further questions on this item? No? OK, we'll move on to item 5.4, amendment to the Municipal Heritage Inventory, number 165 Palmerston Street, Perth. Any questions? No? OK. Next item, 5.6, comment on draft WAPC position statement, special entertainment precincts and JUA consultation paper. Any questions? Councillor Toppleberg? Uh, just, I did ask the question via email during the week, but just, I suppose, a request that we ensure that particularly uh, in areas that we know, uh, particularly with live and amplified music, but live music in particular, which uh, is, seems to be a continual source of uh, consternation in the community, that we ensure that we are engaging with all stakeholders early and get as much information presented to Council through the process as possible, please. Councillors, um, I might just flag an amendment. It may be completely unnecessary, but I thought it might be useful to just add to the recommendation Council's support for the entertainment precincts and to highlight the opportunity that this presents to um, two areas in Vincent, including the Leadville Town Centre. It is in the letter, but I thought that it might be worthwhile just raising that and bringing it forward into the motion. So I'll put that on the table and see if anyone's interested for next Tuesday. Any other questions on this item? OK, thank you. Item, we're moving on now to infrastructure and environment. Item 6.1, tender number 575 of 19, Banks Reserve, Active Zone Construction. Um, just to flag that if there are any questions about the confidential attachments, we do have a confidential item this evening and we can ask questions um, more specifically on those confidential attachments if you wish to at that point. Um, but are there any questions on um, this item, Councillor Castle? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'm just uh, to the director. I'm just wondering if um, has the recommended applicant undertaken any other works in the city of Vincent or in any other locations that we might uh, know about? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I believe they have. But uh, what I'll do is I'll put something in the uh, briefing notes so you can get that information. Um, any further questions, Councillor? Loden. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, never a good sign when you feel like you need to apologise before you ask the question. Um, but I'll still ask the question anyway. Sorry about this. Um, so in our assessment process, when we, we look at this, um, do we have any ability to consider uh, council strategic priorities to give greater direction to the tenderers that we're considering? It's difficult to assess in this context because we're talking about a playground, but um, if the uh, the tenderers have um, different uh, approaches to how they do the work they do that align more strongly with enhanced environment, connected community and so forth, um, and the tenders are close in terms of their consideration, that this might be something we'd consider to then shift which one we selected. So for example, if there were two tenderers and one of them was a local business that is an active part of our community and adds to the vibrancy of our, our town centres, that would there be a benefit? Would we be able to select that one over another one, even if the assessment sort of demonstrated that it was slightly more expensive or they weren't quite as good at delivering on the scope? Uh, through you, Michael, the simple answer is no. Uh, if you look, the report contains the criteria on which the tender was assessed. We publish that with the tender, and then we are bound to um, assess based on that criteria. So, I mean, you, you can see what's in the report, the criteria. So unless there's anything specific in relation to that, then uh, no, we can't. But in theory, if Council felt that um, one of the other tenders was of uh, greater benefit of value to the city, probably not applicable in this context, but in other contexts might be, we could choose to go with a different tenderer. Uh, through you, Michael. Uh, um, 
Again, the simple answer is you can award the tender to whoever you think. Obviously, the administration have made a recommendation based on the tender evaluation, and so I would, uh, re I suppose, suggest that you give regard to that uh, process that we've gone through. But yes, council can award the tender to whoever it wishes. Perhaps an issue to explore further at the audit committee in terms of tender criteria. Um, are there any other questions on this item? I just wanted to ask a question about the very slight um, increase in expenditure coming from the public open space um, allocation. Um, we have considered an item at council about public open space expenditure and there were some areas that were yet to sort of be fleshed out. Could we please have an update on public open space expenditure under the so $250,000 um, if we could just have a bit more of a breakdown so that we can see the impact of taking the $60,000 out of that pool of funding for open space initiatives. Uh, yes, Michael, we can do that. Put that in the briefing notes, Thank the you. current expenditure and what's planned. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. Moving to community and business services. Welcome, Director. Um, so 7.1 financial statements as at the 30th of November 2019. Are there any questions? Councillor Hallett. Um, just a specific and I guess more general um, query. In the statements there's a lot of underspins, um, which is the reason for um, the, a lot of the variances and it's con mainly contributed to by a timing variance of works. I just wanted to ask about the specifically about the two seventy nine and a half grand variance for the parks maintenance and street lighting, um, and then just if there's any other general comments about, I guess the the number of which timing variance is a reason, and whether that's something to do with the time of the year or um, it's just a coincidence that that happens across a range of items. Through you, Michael. Um, it would it be okay for Councillor Hallett to direct me to a page? I can see exactly just to get that right. I mean, I. Probably can't answer this evening. I would put it in the notes, but there's a specific page that I could uh, could see. It's on page comment. one of the actual table of um, expenditure. Okay, thank you. Uh, through me, my call. I'll I'll put that in the briefing notes. Any other questions, Councillor Fatagas? Thank you, Mayor. Um, just on that same page, um, just wanted to get an understanding of the overspend on the law and order and public safety um, and yeah just a bit of understanding on that one please. So you may call I'll also have to take that on notice uh, and again um, if councillor could point me to a specific page that would help. Yes yeah, the same, pa same page director page one of the report. So you may call thank you. Councillors, Councillor Fatakis. Um, and just also to on page four of the report, um, just relating back to, uh, to revenue, um, the first line, um, I'm just assuming that it's just the way that it's displayed in the, um, the tables, but we've got, let me just, one, two, three, four, um, just on uh, on rates, um, the year-to-date variance is coming up with with zero. Um, calculated that as uh, zero point three percent. Just really wanted to see whether that's been an oversight or um, comment on that. Um, uh, through the chair, I'll I'll take that on notice. Thanks, and have a look at it. Councillors. Okay, we can do it all again for December shortly. Um, moving on to 7.2, investment report as at 30th of November 2019. Any questions on this item? Councillor Loden. Just wanted to ask um, the uh, amount of uh, fossil free um, investment in the portfolio seems relatively low. I just wanted to clarify that this is still an active part of the consideration when we're looking at the different banks uh, and term deposit options that we have. Um, and it's just a case of that the rates are better with the fossil fuel banks.
to read my call. I might be best placed to uh, answer that. Um, uh, that is still an active uh, area that the administration is looking at, and um, I can probably uh, put something in the briefing notes to help you with that as well. Councillors, investment report for November. Okay. Next item is 7.3, authorisation of expenditure for the period 19th of November to 31st of December 19. Questions? Um, I did just want to ask a question about Focus Networks, $26,000 managed Wi-Fi, firewall and on-site managed um, network support. Is that um, standard and ongoing, or was that specialist support brought in for a specific issue? Happy to have it taken on notice. These are very specific questions. Uh, through you, Mirko, uh, we can clarify and confirm in the briefing notes, uh, but we have been going through a process of the last few months of upgrading our corporate Wi-Fi capability. Thank you. And also just wondered how many T-shirts we purchased for the summer events um, season at a cost of $3,500. Thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, thank you. And just a further question in, in relation to the Wi-Fi, just if we can confirm uh, whether local businesses uh, were sought uh, for, the, um, for the service provision and if, if they were, why they, why they weren't selected, please. Uh, through you, Mirko, we can uh, confirm that in the briefing notes. Councillors, any further questions on expenditure? Okay, the next item is 7.4, financial statements as at the 31st of December 2019. Any questions on this one? Um, I just have one question for the Director of Infrastructure and Environment. It talked about the waste collection service currently having a $500,000 underspend. And it uh, just prompted me to ask, are we on track with our bulk waste collection for February? And is there any particular reason for the underspend? Uh, through you, McCall, I understand that is just a phasing issue. Uh, and the bulk waste uh, will take place in March. I believe I'll confirm that in the notes. Uh, the contractor wasn't available in February, so I think it's just pushed back a short while. But I'll check that. And when we're having that update, one of the things that we did ask about was a shorter lead-in time for people to present waste to the Verge, etc. So it'd be good to have a, any feedback on that, if we could. Yeah, through my call, sure. That's no problem. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, next item is 7.5, investment report as at the 31st of December 2019. Any questions? See so a slight uptick in... Um, non-fossil non fossil lending investments, 22.6. Uh, Councillor Toppelberg, do you wish to ask a question? No? Okay. No questions? All right. Next item, 7.6, waiver of fees for the WA Football Commission AFL Women's. Any questions on this item? Councillor Fatakis. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just uh, wondering if part of the agreement um, involves the acknowledgement of the City of Vincent as a supporter. Um, it's quite a significant in-kind um, waiver. Um, and any um, agreed associated publicity or um, public acknowledgement um, that needs to be provided. Um, through yourself, Mayor Cole, um, on page one under details down at the bottom of the page, it talks about um, some of the acknowledgement elements through promotional um, activities that will be um, included. So we will be recognised um, through our use of a logo and so on. Thank you, Miss That. Thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. Um, thank you. Just confirming that the request came from the West Australian Football Commission, but is it on behalf of the AFL? Is it actually the AFL that we are waiving the fees for, or is it the Football Commission themselves who are the hiree? Um, through yourself, Mayor Cole, I, my understanding is that our relationship is typically with the, um, uh, with the Football Commission itself um, rather than the AFL, and that's where the arrangement typically lies. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, just to clarify that the, the letter from the Football Commission makes it very clear that they're writing on behalf of the AFL. Oh, thank you. So we're 
uh, they tend to represent the AFL for these events. Councillors, okay, moving on to uh, Vincent 7.7, .7, Vincent Men's Shed Licence for Storage Containers, 10 Farmer Street, Woodville Reserve. Any questions? Councillor Fatakis. Um, through you, Mayor, just looking at um, the location, um, this, the uh, licensed area acknowledged, but um, was there consideration to really specify in the exact location of uh, the containers um, set back from the road and the like? Uh, uh, through you, Mayor Cole, just to clarify, the councillor's question uh, was that uh, the location uh, between the bowling club and the men's shed, uh, was that their request or our suggestion? Was that what you were asking? I'm just trying to get some understanding exactly where the containers are proposed for. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, there is a attachment on page 526 uh, of the report. Um, it says annexure A, and uh, we've highlighted it in orange, and it's essentially in between the men's shed and the bowling club, uh, and with screening and landscaping that would provide the maximum amount of uh, screening from the street, um, and it wouldn't, uh, I don't think it would be noticeable to, to residents in the way uh, have you have you got the attachment there, Councillor? So it yeah, is well you. it's well hidden from the street view. Is our oh, it's on the screen now. Thank you, CEO. That answers my question. Thanks, Councillors. Any further questions, Councillor Loden? Thank you, Chair. I just clarify um, because we have a there's a provision that says we can terminate on one month's notice. Is there any specific reason why we're saying it's only for one year? Because if it takes us longer to complete the master plan or we put plan for it to stay there, um, wouldn't we then just find ourselves back here in this situation of having to do a, a new extension of that um, licence in a year's time, potentially? Um, through yourself, Mayor Cole, I, I believe that the one year is because we're currently negotiating on the lease generally as well. And, uh, and also we've been advised it's just for a short term, but I'll, I'll confirm that in the briefing notes. Thank you, Mayor Cole. I did speak to the director today, but just to confirm, uh, if you can be answered in the briefing notes, whether the shed, any representatives of the shed were informed officially by the city in any capacity that this matter would be coming to this council meeting and this briefing uh, and how they may address the council in relation to it because I know oh, I'll just ask that if that can be included in the briefing notes to whether they were informed uh, either via telephone or email or otherwise. Um, through the Mayor, I know that we have had conversations with them but I'll confirm that. I'm aware the ESL charge has been a challenge in the past um, and just wanted to confirm that they're aware of that ch that charge and um, yeah. Sorry, what, your question is are they aware of the I ESL? I want to confirm that they are aware of that charge and the, the value of it. Um, through the Mayor, I'll confirm that. Shevsky. Uh, just in relation to the other activities occurring on the reserve in the coming months, um, the request to um, investigate options for the one of the other buildings on the site the, uh, that had been vacated by the Multicultural Services Centre. I believe that was something that was due to come back to council. And I'd just like to uh, know if there's any other tenants currently on, the, on Woodville um, since MSCWA vacated. Through you, Mayor Cole, that building is currently vacant. We have invited expressions of interest from several local community groups and at the moment we're considering three responses, I think. We're hoping to present a report to Council in the next month. We're also considering the condition of the building and like what use is appropriate, so we'll present a report to Council once we've completed that. OK, so I believe that the request was that it come in December. Was there a reason for the hold-up? 
through you, Michael. We've been liaising with the different groups who put their submissions in about what terms are appropriate and we're also waiting on the property management framework because that will guide what terms uh, would be in the lease or licence. So I think that's the reason it's been delayed. And so does this licence concur with the property management framework? Through you, Michael. In general, I believe the terms do. However, this needed to be resolved before the property management framework could be um, considered by council because I understand they have um, storage issues that need to be addressed promptly. So that's why we brought it to council independently of the property management framework. That's another matter altogether. I won't ask the question. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Just confirming on the uh, bottom of page 490, it talks about the approval is conditional upon the installation of fencing and plants that effectively screen the containers, just confirming uh, that the plants are to be planted in planters and not in ground, which would potentially, depending how long they are there, potentially have impact uh, on the long term. They would become existing landscaping on site in, if the master plan decided that wasn't the best place for planting in the future, so just confirming it's to be in planters. Through the mayor, I'll confirm that. Can I just clarify, though? Like, say it was just a creeper up a, up some um, lattice. But just for clarity, it may actually they, be they more had, they expensive. Had indicated, they had indicated to me they were intending to plant trees on the basis oh, trees, of what was requested. Okay. On the basis uh, of what was requested by the city, and I had suggested that they don't put them in the yeah, ground because no, it that, may if compromise. it's trees, I can completely understand. But if they were doing something like a creeper on some lattice, then you wouldn't worry too much about that. But yes, thank you for that. Any further questions? Um, can I just ask for the briefing notes what the current lease fee is that the men should pay for the shed in its entirety, so that I get an idea of what this additional licence fee would be as a total cost to the men shed. One, yes, it's one dollar. Correct. So the, sh the shed cost compared to the shipping container cost is quite different. And I just wondered, is, do we believe, like just some rationale from administration as to why we're, we would charge $221 plus GST when the existing shed is a peppercorn? Um, thank you. I'll bring, bring that forward in the, the briefing notes. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. The next item is the, to, on to Chief Executive Officer items. Um, 8.1, permit with Main Roads WA Eco Zone Landscaping of Lot 210 on Deposited Plan 32190, corner of Vincent Street and Leadville Parade, Leadville. Any questions? Councillor Loden? just want to check, it's five grand to um, Eco Zone that site? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's the budget that parks have to do this. Um. Um, was there any reason why main road set four years? So I'm just thinking, I know that $5,000 in the scheme of things is not a large amount of money, but if you could spend $5,000 and you'd be guaranteed it would be in place for eight years, that, you know, that would be even better. Is that just a sort of a standard four-year provision or was there some rationale that they thought they might be using the verge? Through you, Mayor Cole, we did originally request to acquire the freehold in the land because it's Man Ro Main Road's freehold lot. They said that it could be required in the future for transport infrastructure. I believe they were looking at um, a light rail or something previously, so that's why they wouldn't transfer it to us in freehold. Four years was their standard term and they we were looking for longer tenure, but they basically said four years was the longest they could provide. It'd be really good if we could get light rail in four years down <laughs> Leadville Parade. That's a good sign. <laughs> um, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Just in terms of the costs, and um, uh, what proportion of the proposed eco-zoning is going to be hard stand and is that, and um, versus, I mean, is it, I can't recall if it's actual just wood chips or if it's just, um, and is that any sort of contributor to the, a major contributor to the cost? Through you, Michael. I mean, EcoZone is usually no hard stand or very little, but I can check what's planned if you want to put that in the briefing notes. Council for Tarkas. Um, through you, Mayor Dissert, um, uh, the budget include uh, reticulating um, that uh, very small patch of land. 
uh, through my call. Again, ecozoning usually doesn't require water. I mean, that's one of the reasons we ecozone is to reduce the use of water. But again, I can check what exactly is planned for those bits of land. Councillors. Okay. Moving on to 8.2, acquisition of private rights of way. Lots 350 to 357 on plan 2503, bounded by Scarborough Beach, Green, Fairfield, Matlock Streets, Mount Hawthorne as Crown Land, investing in the city as public rights of way. Any questions? Okay, no questions. Okay, the next item is 8.3 Information Bulletin. Any questions? Councillor Hallett. Um, just a few in relation to the register of reports to be actioned. Um, one is, and I suspect these will mostly be on notice, um, one is related to the North Perth Precinct traffic study and the update is that public consultation will be undertaken on the proposed traffic calming measures and just wondering whether we can get a timeline on when that will be occurring. Um, I might just go through the other ones. Um, And there was also one about the Perth um, CBD and the parking levy um, and, and that waiting on an outcome for that report to be produced. I'm wondering if we've got a timeline for that and um, how that will intersect with our timeline for the ITP as well. Through Mayor Cole, I just wanted to clarify, are you referring to the updated versions of the council reports to action? Because originally the wrong, the previous version was attached, so we've put them as replacement attachments. One moment, please. Both comments still apply. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the, uh, I'll put, the, put some timelines in the briefing notes. I know work's being done on those, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head the exact timeline, but I'll put that in the notes. Do you want to speak? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, Councillor Hallett, so it was 10.3 North Perth Precinct Traffic Study. What was the other item? 12.5 uh, Perth Parking Levy. Any further questions on the Info Bulletin? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Questions through you to the Acting Director of Development Services. Um, out of the SAT appeals uh, lists the refusal of 149 to 153 Alma Road, which my assumption is was refused under delegated authority, which was for eight multiple dwellings, uh, eight group dwellings, um, and it says that the mediation is temporarily listed for the 13th of February 2020. Uh, the all of the lots on site, are, I don't know whether they have had titles issued, but they're separately they are, they are all listed for sale as individual lots currently. Uh, can we perhaps just get some information in the briefing notes because I have had some queries from surrounding neighbours about what was approved, what is to be expected on the site or otherwise. Um, it's currently between that and the adjacent lots which have been subdivided and sold. It's a couple of thousand square metres of vacant land uh, that um, if we can get some idea of where that's actually at and uh, well, I, guess, I mean the, the implications I suppose of proceeding uh, to the SAT which obviously has an impact on city resources if they are in fact selling off the land and it's incapable of achieving what they're arguing through SAT. I'd be curious as to whether we would be able to see costs potentially if they are taking us through a process that doesn't relate to... Uh, if, if it's not able to be achieved on the land, I'd be curious as to what costs we have to incur in that process too. Through you, Mayor Cole, happy to provide that in briefing notes. Um, uh, administration has been uh, contacted with similar queries um, because uh, adjoining residents were advertised to during the consultation period as well. So um, that's why we can provide that in the briefing note. Councillors, Councillor Gondoszewski. 
In relation to this item, would it be possible to request an additional column in this table? Um, just where, um, for example, a council resolution has requested a report come back by a particular month or there's been a, a decision to action something by a particular date. Could we have a, an additional comment that actually includes that month or date so that um, it's clear perhaps which items are um, overdue and which ones are on track? Through you, Merkel, yes. Thank you, CEO. Any further questions? Okay. The next item is 8.4, lease of 246 Vincent Street, Leaderville to Minister for Works, Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries, Amendment to Incentive. Any questions, Councillor Lowden? Um, so my understanding is that the big change here is that we've shifted the time frame of these the payments out of those initial two years to spread it over three years, but then we're going to have to pay an extra 25k over that period of time. Um, roughly, it's shifting about half a million, deferring half a million dollars worth of expenditure by two years. So, is that, from a financial point of view, is that is spending the extra 25 grand worth having the the two year delay of that? money being shifted from a cost of capital or whatever is interest in, on the money that we would have in the bank that we would be using otherwise? Uh, through you, Merkel, and just to clarify, the original proposal from the tenant was uh, to make the first payment uh, this financial year as well, and that would have uh, been a challenge given our current funding arrangements. So the um, based on the amendment, um, adopted previously by our council. This is uh, sticking to the origin our original intent of uh, ensuring the first payment takes place next financial year and spread over three years. There is a time value for money um, involved here. Uh, yes, you've described it as a payment, uh, but for want of a better word, this is essentially a mechanism to uh, agree a square meterage um, rent and whether that was agreed as a single um, rent figure per square metre over the 10-year lease or uh, this mechanism of an upfront lease payment. It's roughly equivalent. Is that how they came to this figure of 25 grand extra? Through your Merkel, uh, yes. Councillors, any questions? Okay. Moving on, we now go to our supplementary agenda. For 8.5, which is an interstate conference attendance for a National Climate Emergency Summit on the 14th to the 15th of February 2020, Melbourne, for Councillor Hallett. Are there any questions on this item? No? Okay. Um, that then leaves just one um, item for this evening, which is the confidential item. So um, I'll just need to um, go behind closed doors for that item. So for those who've joined us on the live stream tonight, thank you very much. Hope to see you again next Tuesday for the decision-making meeting. <laughs>